So, Putin here. Um, I am so excited. Um, David Hanscom is a leading um, spinal orthopedic surgeon from the United States, um, but his great passion is actually dealing with everything that goes with pain, uh, the anxiety, um, helping people find hope and optimism um, to find a holistic cure. And um, I think the work he's doing is fantastic. And I am so grateful for you joining us today, David. Thank you, Dr. I'm very, very happy to be here. So David, um, the first question we always ask in these web webinars is, what makes you optimistic? Um, what makes you optimistic is the incredible for human be beings to heal themselves. And I'm a well being in absolute decades of chronic pain, and all of a sudden they email me and going, they're fine. And these are people that have suffered horribly for years. The med medical profession has written them off. And I look at my work as basically a structure that applies proven medical treatments to chronic pain, because we now know the nature of chronic pain. And once a patient understands the nature of chronic pain, they're able to figure out their own solution. But basically, the essence of chronic pain is feeling safe, which optimizes your body's chemistry. And then the body's capacity to heal under those circumstances is unbelievable. Fantastic. And, you know, the world is uh, now looking for leaders um, who are realistic and infectiously optimistic. Um, in your life and in your career, who are the leaders who've inspired you? I mean, personally, my hero is Nelson Mandela. I, he just is sort of my personal pillar of um, what life's all about. Um, other people. Martin Luther King, just his uh, persistence, and he, uh, yeah, um, also uh, J.K. Rowling, the 2008 Harvard commencement sheet called The Fringe Benefits of Poverty. Um, so people like that have just dealt with adversity in a positive way. Um, you've heard of Viktor Frankl, who wrote the book Man's Search for Meaning. That book just blows me away. Um, he found actual... Um, so yeah, people like that. Uh, fantastic. And, and in fact, uh, you, you quote Viktor Frankl on your website. Um, and right. You, the American Consul General here um, at a refugee event um, in the country. It was Viktor Frankl uh, that he okay. went to to find optimism in such circumstances of deprivation and pain. Right. Um, inspiration to us all. So right. tell us, how did you, from orthopedic surgeon, um, specializing in spinal deformity to this notion of back in control. What, what's your journey? Well, what happened, I trained at a very high level spine fellowship. I spent my first eight years in practice being very, very aggressive doing spine surgery. I was taught that spine surgery, surgery was the solution for definitive solution for back pain. And I did the surgeries aggressively. I did a lot of them. I noticed that a lot of people that I would do the perfect operation were not doing well, and I did not understand about chronic pain at all. Then around 1990, I developed an acute onset of chronic pain, and I did come out of that hole for about 13 years, and it was horrible. So I developed chronic pain myself, and I honestly would not know exactly what chronic pain was without my own personal experience. I think the reason why the book has been so successful in treating people with chronic pain because I did every so my chronic pain experience was severe it was extreme it was, I had no hope I was in a dark hole like I described called the abyss nobody could tell me what was going on of course I saw every doctor possible since I'm a surgeon nobody could tell me what was going on and I'm fine I was my first own example that chronic pain is solvable I didn't even know what chronic pain was until I went through my own experience but yet, I think the reason why the book's been so successful, it outlines a stepwise program that has evolved. I tried many sequences on myself, but also with my patients that didn't work. And gradually, a sequence came around that really helped people consistently come out of the hole. The other exciting part about it to me is about 90% self-directed. You do not need a major pain clinic or medical intervention to come out of chronic pain. So I'm watching hundreds and hundreds of patients go to pain-free that I'm watching patients have surgery that doesn't work. It's actually been documented not to work. 
the actual success rate for a back fusion for back pain is about 22%. And it's not good. And it's damaging, it's risky, it's expensive. And the last five years of my practice, I watched three to five patients every week undergo you know, different types of spine fusions, and they were worse. At the same time, I'm watching hundreds of patients go to pain-free with no risk, no expense. So I quit in December 2018. I actually quit my practice at the peak of my career to pursue this project full-time. It's fantastic. One of the things I love about this project of yours um, is the stories of hope and optimism that you share. Um, you know, whether it's Disney or Coke, the big brands have figured out that people are sick of doom and gloom and actually want hope and optimism. The thing I love about your website is that you share those stories and you invite people to share their stories and you invite people who aren't even your patients to share their stories and then comment on it. And so tell us more um, about that sharing of stories and hope and, and optimism and how it helps you and how it helps um, your patients and followers. Well, first of all, when you're in chronic pain, you're bounced around, you're given endless medical treatments, and you get your hopes up and they get dashed, hopes up and get dashed. And we, they've shown in animal studies that when you repeatedly dash hopes, you induce a depression. But the treatments we offer patients in chronic pain have been documented to be ineffective. It's also been documented, it's also been documented that in research that optimism is a major factor in healing. But it's all about the body's chemistry. So when you feel safe, when you have hope, you have optimism, your body's full of serotonin, dopamine, um, oxytocin, and the GABA-type drugs, which are anti-anxiety drug, drugs, growth hormone. So when you're full of those chemicals, you feel great. When you're full of adrenaline, cortisol, histamine, cytokines, the stress chemicals, you don't feel very good. So engendering a sense of gratitude optimism hope is really really one of the core concepts of healing from chronic pain and uh, i mean the, the evidence around that is now so strong i mean you've got harvard the american military boston university reporting last year that optimism is the key to healthy longevity correct um, now, sinai medical system i think it was a week later said that optimism was the key pro protector against heart disease and the key predictor of recovery from heart disease. So in dealing with this, so in helping your patients find greater optimism, what do you find is most effective in lifting their spirits and helping them to be more positive? I think the key factor that starts the thing, so we do workshops based on awareness, hope, forgiveness, and play. And what it does, I think what really starts the optimism and hope is understanding the problem. If you're treating a problem with the wrong paradigm, it can't work. We now understand that chronic pain is a brain disease. The new research in the last 10 years has shown that there's all sorts of neurological patterns that cause chronic pain. It's like the brain short circuits. It's really key to understand chronic pain because it's similar to like what, once you have pain in your brain over six to 12 months, it goes, it becomes memorized. It's like riding a bicycle. Those circuits become perfect. And just like that, you cannot learn how to ride a bicycle. You can't unlearn your pain. It's a big problem. So what we found out that you literally can rewire your brain around anything. And I just have to stop and tell you a story of a gentleman I talked to this morning. He contacted me about two weeks ago on Facebook. And his story illustrates the fact that I think anybody can heal from anything. And it gave me a sense of optimism and hope that I actually hadn't had before. But this gentleman is now about 66 years old. He developed chronic pain after lift and injury around age 40, 45. And he has had 27 surgeries. He was on high dose narcotics. Six of those surgeries were spine surgeries, four in the lower back, six in the neck. He was on high dose opioids. He had two, su two suicide attempts. When I see somebody that's that bad of a shape, to me, the pain circuits are so embedded that it's impossible to get better. We always try. We never know who's going to respond or not. Anyway, he started working with a physician down in Palm Desert in Southern California who really, but who very, he uses very much my approach about calming the body down, 
moving forward, et cetera. Then he picked up my book. He just picked up my book before he saw this gentleman in Southern California. And he got hope. And he realized that chronic pain is a curable problem. That's the key. It's not to be managed. Chronic pain is a curable problem. Long story short, through a combination of what I call expressive writing, relaxation, meditation, particularly forgiveness and anger, he's fine. He has no pain, no medications, no pain. His family is thriving. And I asked him the question I asked a lot of people is that once you break out of this chronic pain mold, you actually live life at a level that you've never lived before because you're not fighting anxiety. It also turns out that the mental pain is a much bigger problem than the physical pain. So essentially what we're doing in spine surgery, we have a success rate of 22% for back pain. We're essentially operating on a brain disease and the problems in the brain, not in the spine. Then it turns out that anxiety is the pain. We're basically doing spine surgery for anxiety and it doesn't work. In fact, it's horribly damaging. Right now in the United States, we're, we're spending somewhere between, I, I can't get the exact numbers, but about 15 to $20 billion a year on spine surgery. Probably 70% of that should not be done. Um, anxiety. Um, in the state of Victoria, in which um, the city of Melbourne is, is in, in which I live, there's been a royal commission, which is our highest form of judicial inquiry into mental health treatment. And they've made a finding in this state that diagnosed anxiety and depression has doubled this century. It's, it's, because, like, we're, it's because we're treating it absolutely incorrectly. That's it. So tell, tell me more about that because I've tried to get sense out of the Royal Commission. I've tried to get sense out of the Productivity Commission. But all they say is that there's a problem, but they seem right. capable of finding the source. So give us some of your insights, David. So if you don't mind, I'm going to spend about five or 10 minutes on this, because if I leave one message with your audience, this is it, is that anxiety is simply a physiological response to a threat. It's not a psychological problem. It's based on the body's physiology. If my cat's threatened by a dog or some wild creature, she has a reaction of survival. Her muscles tense, her hair stands up, she takes off. But once the danger is passed, she comes right back down and goes to sleep. She's done. <clears throat> Every living creature has a survival response. It's how we evolved, it's how we thrive, it's how we survive. It turned out that survival response is how it's just necessary for life. Humans have language. We put the word anxiety on the survival response. And let me ask you a question. I was always taught that anxiety was a psychological issue, correct? Yes, indeed. Okay. Okay, so the unconscious brain processes about 20 million bits of information per second. Just take a guess how much the conscious brain processes. Mm, I don't know. No, you have to tell me. 40. It's 20 million bits of information per second versus 40. Okay. So we have the survivor response. So my people constrict, my mouth is moving. So I form words. I'm shifting in my chair. My heart rate is going at a certain rate. My body chemistry is changing. All of that's unconscious. So again, any threat for every living creature, the way we stay alive is the survival response. Again, humans have a problem and we have a word for it called anxiety. Anxiety is a physiological response to a threat. It is not psychological. And the reason why it's so critical to understand, you're looking at 20 million versus 40. So it's impossible to solve, right? Plus, what would happen if you didn't have anxiety? You wouldn't survive. You wouldn't breathe. Your heart rate wouldn't respond. So anxiety is necessary for life, but anxiety is what you have. It's not who you are. So what we find out is that anxiety is simply a sensation generated by the stress response. In other words, you have elevated stress chemicals. It gives you a sensation of anxiety. So the question I have to ask you, which you won't answer because it's a rhetorical question. So if it, it's, I'm just for teaching purposes, honestly. I'm not trying to be difficult here, but it's a huge paradigm shift. If anxiety simply represents the sensation generated by elevated stress chemicals, how do you lower anxiety? You simply lower the stress chemicals. Mm -hmm. That's it. So humans have a major problem in that we have consciousness. Thoughts go in an unpleasant thoughts, go to the same part of the brain as a physical threat. 
but humans cannot escape their thoughts. And so every human being is subjected to a different range of unpleasant thoughts. We can suffer with them, suppress them, or mask them. But as you know, we try not to think about something that makes it worse. We know masking works actually while you're you know, drinking or whatever you're doing. It actually temporarily solves the problem, but long-term, of course, it's not healthy. So you either suffer, suppress, or mask your thoughts. You can't escape your thoughts. So what happens, we have sustained exposure to elevated stress chemicals. Every human being has to deal with this sensation we call anxiety. It's a 20 million to 40 ratio. It's a big problem. So if you try talk therapy to try to control anxiety, that's not going to work, right? It's just, a, it's, just a, it's a huge mismatch. So it's really critical to understand anxiety is what you have. It is a gift. It's a gift of life, but it's not who you are. I wrote a website post called Anxiety, Your Prison Guard or Bodyguard. So it's your bodyguard. It helps you navigate danger, stay safe. Every second, your body automatically isn't, acts in a way that keeps you safe. All, so humans survive, all animals survive, by avoiding danger and gravitating towards rewards. So what happened is that who you are is this conscious brain so once you, so the first step is to separate anxiety from who you are. So if you identify with anxiety as psychological or part of your identity, it's your prison guard, right? I mean, most of our lives are limited by anxiety and we feel guilty about it. We feel ashamed. It feels horrible. It's all encompassing, but guess what? Not who you are. It's your survival response. So the first step to solve anxiety is to separate the response from your identity. I ask people say, look, get rid of the get rid of the word anxiety out of your vocabulary completely. Just get rid of it. And when you feel agitated or nervous or whatever, just say the words, my stress chemicals are elevated. And the way you lower your stress chemicals, we'll talk about that, that in a second. But just get rid of the word anxiety, visualize a large thermometer on the other wall. And depending on how much unpleasantness you have, then just visualize the thermometer going up or down. What your goal is of course, is to lower the stress chemicals. Again, anxiety is simply a sensation generated by elevated stress chemicals. If you're lying on the beach full of oxytocin and dopamine and serotonin, you feel relaxed, right? But you wouldn't call relax a psychological diagnosis, correct? True. So anxiety is the same thing. Anxiety is a description of your body's chemical state. That's not a diagnosis either. It's just a description of your body's chemical state. So the key issue is separating the reaction from who you are. That's the first step. The second step is you can lower your, so there's two ways to lower your stress chemicals. One is directly. The other one is called neuroplasticity. So directly is some things like mindfulness, meditation, exercise, visualization. And the little exercise I do call active meditation that we can do right now, where you simply put your brain on a different sensation for about three to five seconds. For instance, you have, if you have racing thoughts, instead of trying to rationalize and do battle with these thoughts, you know, just drop your shoulders for a second, feel the back of your chair, that's it, okay? You take a deep breath, drop it down. How's that feel? Fantastic. Okay, so what you've done, you simply change the sensory input from racing thoughts to a different sensation. So taste your food. Feel the breeze, listen to your footsteps, listen to music. And it's just three to five seconds all day long. So it doesn't take extra time. If you're inclined to do a meditation practice, that's excellent. Meditation is a great way to sustain your healing, but it's not a good place to start. I mean, to be a skilled meditator takes a lot of practice. And unfortunately, when you first start healing from chronic pain, your thoughts are so wild and crazy that actually the quiet is somewhat counterproductive. But long-term, once you've gotten out of the hole, why meditation is a very effective means. So again, as far as lowering stress chemicals, the first step is to separate the anxiety from who you are. In other words, get rid of the, get rid of the word anxiety, visualize that thermometer, and understand this is a gift, nothing to be ashamed of. And then the direct means are mindfulness meditation, exercise. Those are direct means of doing it. But another method which is equally or maybe more important is to dampen the survival response. So you've heard of the term neuroplasticity, of course. 
And what we did know in medical school is that our brains change every second. And new connections, new neurons, new dendrites, all sorts of things happen every second. It's incredibly dynamic stu structure. The brain has 80 to 100 billion nerve cells. Each neuron, which blows me away, has 10,000 dendrites or connections with other nerves. It's an incredibly complex system. So what you're doing, instead of being stress, automatic survival response, it's stress, a little bit of a space, and then you redirect the response to a more rational response. The steps in neuroplasticity are awareness, separation, reprogramming. And the way we start the healing process is called expressive writing, which would be write down your thoughts and tear them up. The reason why you're tearing them up is for two reasons. One of them is, first of all, the writing separates you from your thoughts. You can't control your thoughts, but you're separating from your thoughts. The thoughts are on the table, you're here. There's a space that's now connected by vision and feel. So that does the awareness and separation when move. Then just drop your shoulders for a second and do the active meditation. And that's it. So it's awareness, separation, reprogramming. We don't know why it's so powerful, but the expressive writing has been documented in over a thousand research papers to be effective. It's unbelievable. And for me personally, actually, I just looked this up yesterday. There's a book out called um, Opening It Up by Writing It Down by Dr. James Pennybaker. And there's about 500 references in this book. And it's like skin healing, rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, viral load in AIDS. Same thing with, I just wrote a website post about the um, viral load in the corona, the coronavirus. You can actually express it writing. It's been documented to lower the virus load in the human body. So it just changes the body's chemistry somehow. And so the expression writing does awareness and separation in one shot. And then the active meditation is a simple redirection tool. But if you're doing meditation mindfulness just to distract yourself, the pain is still running the show. But again, the mental pain is a much bigger problem than the physical pain because you are sustained to, you are exposed to sustained levels of stress chemicals. Then there's over 30 different physical symptoms that result from these sustained stress chemicals. So we know autoimmune disorders go up, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, there's migraine headaches, palpitation, irritable bowel, spastic bladder, burning sensations, skin rashes, back pain, neck pain, ringing in the ears, tinnitus. So what happens when your body's exposed to these stress chemicals over a period of time, each organ is going to respond in its own way. Of the 30 possible symptoms of chronic stress, or in other words, elevations of stress chemicals, I had 17 of these at the same time. 17. I was completely miserable didn't know what to do. The physical symptoms were intolerable and it was horrible. So then you're trapped with all these mental symptoms and physical symptoms with no hope. It's pretty dark, Yeah. right? So you talk about optimism. So you can't just do gratitude and optimism when you're in the hole. The essence of healing is allowing yourself to feel safe. But the first step is allowing yourself to be with your pain then happiness emerges. So once you understand the rules and the nature of chronic pain, it becomes solvable. That's a huge step as far as optimism. So that education is really critical. Then you have Dr. Laura Mosley down there in Australia, who's really committed to educating the population about chronic pain. He does a bike ride every year, and I don't remember exactly what his process is called, but he goes on a 1,500-mile bike ride every year throughout Australia actually get the message out that chronic pain is a curable, solvable problem. So again, awareness, hope, forgiveness, and play. So becoming aware of the nature of chronic pain is a first step in creating some hope. Second of all, the stories just go on and on and on. So understand how people can actually solve the chronic pain. And again, this gentleman who had 27 surgeries and is now pain-free blew me away. For me personally, I, I actually sort of knew this, but anybody can heal. You can rewire your brain around almost anything. And for me personally, it gave me a tremendous hope that I don't give up on anybody ever. But this one really just gave me a huge shot in the arm. The third step, forgiveness, is a more complex way of awareness, separation, and reprogramming. Because with forgiveness, you become aware you're angry. Forgiveness is a separation process. And then play, 
a sense of play is the reprogramming process. But you can't have a sense of play if you're angry. Mm. If you're obsessively playing to distract yourself from the pain, that's not going to work. So again, you have to actually learn to be with the anxiety, learn to be with the anger. They're both necessary. They're both going to be unpleasant. They're supposed to be unpleasant to compel, to compel you to take survival action. So you have to learn to live with your anxiety and anger, learn to assimilate it, quit fighting it. Then as you learn to be with your pain, so to speak, happiness emerges. So then the final solution, well, there's a bunch of final solutions, but one of them is play. And again, you can't start there. I mean, how can you play when you're angry, frustrated, and trapped? That's not going to happen, right? You need to extricate yourself from the hole first. Then you, you develop a sense of wonderment, gratitude, curiosity. And then what happens, your body, and that's a rapid shift because the way the human organism evolved was with play, interacting with other human beings. So reconnecting to those pathways that are already there is an extraordinarily powerful but also rapid way of coming out of chronic pain. Then the final solution is, I call it the spiritual journey, which can be manifested in almost any way you would like, which is perspective, good food, good wine, good friends, religious, religious experience if you would like, whatever it takes to get your perspective back, because again, when you're fighting anxiety and frustration and pain, it's hard to go there. And then the corollary of that is giving back, and when you're focused on giving back, then of course your attention is going the opposite direction. The hardest part of this project by far and away is that you can't fix yourself because your attention is on the problem, not the solution. So it's a matter of creating the vision, moving forward with the thought your pain. And then as this rewiring process occurs in your brain, it's, it's unbelievable how well people can do. And you say people can do it themselves or are they better off with a guide or a guru? Don't need one. You do not need one. Um, this is the tricky part. I, I mean, all of us want to fix ourselves, right? Yep. So again, where's your attention? Well, it's on your, okay. it's on yourself, right? So it's on the problem. So this is the hardest part of the project by far in a way it's paradoxical is that what you're doing is like learning a new language. In other words, you create a vision of what you, of what you want your life to look like. And then you start executing the plan. And it's like, you're going to learn French by practicing French. And after you've learned the French, something happened to your brain. In other words, your brain changed so you can speak fluent French, but you didn't learn French by trying to correct your English. The default language for human survival is pain survival. And the new language I want people to learn is called, quote, an enjoyable life, unquote. You decide what you want your life to look like, what do you want in it, who do you want in it, how do you want to experience your life. As you start moving toward that vision, as opposed to fixing your pain, your brain starts to change dramatically. It is about a 90% self-directed process. That being said, if you can use the, it's called the Doc Project, the website's backincontrol.com. So the book is called Back in Control, A Surgeon's Roadmap Out of Chronic Pain. That gives you the background, but it's just a book, right? It's just a book. It's only by learning and practicing the tools to help you calm down your nervous system that people start to heal. And so it's a learned skill. It, you don't have to believe it. In other words, I tell my patients all the time, you don't have to believe a word I just said. In fact, if you don't believe it, write it down. Just start going through the tools that allow your brain to change. And then what happens is as the brain starts to change, you're able to grasp more and more of the concepts. And again, when I talked to this gentleman this afternoon about his 27 surgeries and he's fine, he's been fine for three years now, but people end up thriving at a level that they've never thrived at before because they're not fighting the pain anymore, even before they started having chronic pain. So a similar device the American military now uses, I think, is the writing exercise, My Best Self. Okay. Visualize yourself three months hence, six months hence, a year hence. And I think that's very similar to what you're saying. You know, I don't know that program enough to comment on it, but let me ask you a question specifically. Is that there's a real tendency to use optimism as the solution. And the first step is actually being with the pain, then allowing optimism to emerge. Is that resonate with you or is that a little bit different? 
Yeah, for us, um, optimism is a tool. So we use the Harvard definition, which is optimism is a belief that things will work out in the end, that good things will happen. But you don't have to believe that every dark cloud has a silver lining. You know, bad right. things happen to good people. And for us, when, you know, for instance, working in prison, um, you know, these guys are going to be there for another 10 years, no matter how right. optimistic they are. But right. as you say, I change their greeting. So I say, you know, instead of F you to the warder, it's ah, what's the best thing happening to you, Bill? Right. And, and what was extraordinary in that intervention is it was so small and yet it was noticed by the warders. It was noticed by the management. Here were prisoners being happier in themselves and actually bringing happiness to other people. Right. Uh, and we see the world as weighed down in a fog of pessimism and cynicism. So right. you see the increasing pessimism. You see in Australia, the statistics are very high for increased anxiety, increased depression, increased suicide. All of these things are at record levels. And we say what, what people are yearning for, exactly as you say, are stories of hope and optimism. And what they need is realistic and infectiously optimistic leadership. As a so, out of so, let me, so let me review this really clearly one more time. So anxiety is not psychological. It is a physiological, re physiological response to a threat. And by treating it psychologically, that's where we're doing a lot of damage to our whole world, not just Australia. I mean, again, it's 20 million bits of information per second compared to 40. You're not going to solve this thing. If you didn't have anxiety, you would die. You need it to survive. So again, the first step is to separate this response, amoral sociopathic response from your identity. And what we're making a pitch for in our psychiatric diagnostic coding system is to remove anxiety from the diagnostic coding system completely. Because this sensation of stress chemicals is unpleasant, and the psychological diagnosis come from trying to cope with this unpleasant sensation. And so talk therapy doesn't work at all, right? Because you're, you're talking about the problem, and again, it's a 20 million to 40 ratio. So again, the way you decrease anxiety is that we decrease the stress chemicals. I'm telling you, once people understand the fact that this is who they, this is part of their survival, it's powerful, and they learn the tools and start dropping on stress chemicals, it's not very hard. And so what happens, we're saying, look, for instance, I wrote an article called Depression is Anxiety. Because if you look at depression, and I went through this myself, is that the first, first sign of depression is that you wake up early in the morning and can't go back to sleep. Well, that's anxiety, that's racing thoughts. Then you can't fall asleep, which is again, racing thoughts. Then you're not sleeping, which is a problem, creates its own set of problems. Then you can't concentrate, which is a combination of these racing thoughts and lack of sleep. Then you're fatigued because your body's full of adrenaline and cortisol just wears you out. So what happens, depression is just a set of symptoms driven by anxiety, which is not psychological. So same thing with bipolar, you have these huge mood swings, but guess what? The moods are created by these huge chemical shifts. So again, that's a reaction to the chemical response. Same thing with eating disorders. The antidote to anxiety is control. So controlling eating is one of the ultimate controls. So again, driven by anxiety. Our contention is that you teach people to lower stress chemicals, get rid of the word anxiety, get it out of the psychiatric coding system because it's not psychological. And then you're still helpful to treat the symptoms. I'm not saying you shouldn't treat the sleep, shouldn't treat the family issues, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of things psychologists can do, but separating, and I, I actually think this is a human survival issue because we keep treating this problem psychologically where it's not. It's powerful, it drives human behavior. And I didn't mention this before, but anxiety and anger are the same thing. In other words, anxiety is a response to a threat. Your stress chemicals are elevated. The antidote, the antidote to anxiety is control. When you lose control of anything, then your body kicks in more stress chemicals in an effort to regain control and you become angry. Well, anger is destructive. It's only about you. It shuts down the blood supply to the frontal lobe of your brain. You don't think clearly. It shuts down the blood supply to your gut and bladder. So it increases the blood supply to your muscles, sweating in your skin, et cetera. Anger is just a survival response, which is also not psychological. So you have these powerful survival reactions that 
once you teach people to calm these things down, and by the way, this can be done right there in first grade and preschool. Once you teach people the nature of anxiety, again, physiological, not psychological, and teach these kids onward, just ways to drop down the stress chemicals, things change quickly. So that's really my message today is, and then and again, the reason I quit my practice because I was seeing so many people damaged by spine surgery. And I was seeing so many people get better without, again, this gentleman with 27 surgeries just blew me away. Um, I have another girl that had been in chronic, she's 35 now. She had chronic anxiety since she was 10. She, she developed sort of total body pain since she was 15, about 20 years ago. She started working with me last, a year ago, January. It was six months, she was pain-free. Anxiety dropped. She was re-engaging her, re in her artist career. She did it mostly on her own. She has some help with a psychologist to help calm her down. So I guess what I'm saying the long way, as far as solving chronic pain, you can do it on your own. It's helpful to have support systems like healers and stuff to help guide you out of it. But it's 90% your efforts, and it's right there on the website. And, and as you say, I mean, you surround yourself with the right people. You know, one of the things we, one of the suggestions, in fact, I think um, the, uh, the Duchess who is standing down from the British royal family, um, in fact, right. surround yourself with optimistic people. Right. I would heartily agree with that. Did you see that one spot on my website where one of our cardinal rules is not allowing people to discuss their pain? Did you happen to see that by chance? Oh, I missed that. Tell us more. One of the most powerful things, remember that we're, we're dealing with neuroplasticity. Your brain's going to develop wherever you place your attention. If you're in my office right now as a patient, I, I will say, look, when you walk out of my office, you'll never discuss your pain or medical care ever again with anybody, especially your family. You can talk always with the healthcare providers, but friends, family, colleagues, no discussing your pain, no complaining, no gossiping, no giving for unasked for advice, no criticism. Because where's your brain? Yeah. So all those, so what we found out that the expressive writing is a very powerful tool. So if you write down your thoughts, tear them up. That's always a foundational starting point. The active meditation is the second step. Sleep is a huge factor, affected by lots of other things, but you've got to get some sleep. But not discussing your pain is a huge factor in moving people forward. We were blown away. And I didn't realize this, how much people talked about their pain. And I get it. I did the same thing. You're miserable. You can't find an answer. But literally, people spent 70% of their daytime talking about their pain. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. And literally, they'll look at me and go, well, what do I talk about? It's fascinating, but it's also incredibly powerful. So when they come back in for the two-week follow-up visit, they were so excited, and their families were so excited. So talk about optimism. Just that one little tool gave, gave them a lot of hope. Well, you are absolutely brilliant, David. Um, I hope we can join you again maybe in a few months' time, just as, as our work continues to develop and your work continues to develop. We'll put, um, we've already got your links up on our website. Uh, we'll make sure that people can find your book through our website. Um, and we really, really look forward to staying in touch. And you've been so generous with your time. You are so generous to the community. Um, I think you are an exemplar of everything you've talked about. Well, thank you. I appreciate that very much. So I, I love talking to your audience. And yeah, there's lots of different talk, things to talk about. The family issues, are, again, is a whole topic we never even touched on. But we found a huge, huge resource in dealing with family structure. And that's been also a great thing. So no, thank you very, very much. David, have a splendid day. And on behalf of everyone at the Centre for Optimism, our audience on Facebook and on Zoom, and then a lot of people will be watching this in the recorded uh, state, uh, we are so grateful. So